In this last lecture about the forces on aircraft, we will discuss briefly the two remaining forces, the thrust and the weight. In a horizontal steady flight, the thrust force is in equilibrium with the drag, and the weight is in equilibrium with the lift. Drag and lift have been discussed in previous lectures. Let's start with the thrust. The thrust force is provided by engines, either by propeller engines or by jet engines. From the first years onwards, aircraft have been using propeller engines. At the start, these were piston engines. Nowadays, most propeller engines are turboprop engines. The efficiency of these engines has been increased tremendously. The main disadvantage of propeller aircraft is the limited speed. Once the airspeed at the propeller tips approaches the speed of sound, the efficiency of the propeller reduces. One way to counter this, partially, is to use more but shorter blades in the propeller. The second main engine type is the jet engine. The airflow flows through the engine, it is compressed, mixed with fuel, and there is continuous combustion of the mixture. Beyond, beyond the combustion area is the turbine where the air expands and the power is generated. Part of that power is used to drive the compressor. The jet engine was invented just before the Second World War, but only after the war, in the early 50s, it entered civil aviation. The most commonly used jet engine today is the turbofan. For this engine, only a portion of the air flows through the hot section of the engine, including the combustion area. Most air is, after passing a large fan, bypassed. The bypass ratio is the ratio of the amount of air that is bypassed in relation to the amount of air flowing through the hot section. Today, bypass ratios of 8 exist and this number is still increasing. A turbojet has no bypass and a ramjet has no distinct compressor or turbine. In the ramjet, the air is compressed by special designed inlets and shockwaves. As stated before, the thrust force should counteract the drag. The higher the drag, the higher the required thrust. In this perspective, one could ask, why do we fly at high altitudes? If we look at the formula, CL and S, the wing area, are nearly constant. The density and the velocity are now the variables. Based on the formula for drag, there are four combinations of altitude and airspeed. The first option is to fly at a high altitude and at a low speed. At high altitude, the drag is small, of the low velocity and the low density. Therefore, the required thrust is small too. But, in this case also the lift force is small, and the lift will not be high enough to compensate the weight. So this is a no-go option. The second option is to fly at low altitudes and at low speed. This is possible. Most of the general aviation aircraft do. The air density at low altitudes is rather high, so there will be sufficient lift. On the other hand, the airspeed is low, which also limits the drag. The engine should be able to supply sufficient power to overcome the drag. Option 3 is to fly high at high speed. As we have seen, the air density at high altitude is low, and this should be compensated by a high speed, to have adequate lift. At the same time, the low density, combined with a high airspeed, result in an acceptable drag force. This can be overcome by sufficient powerful engines. This combination, flying high at high speed, is commonly used for civil aviation. The high speed also limits the travel time over longer distances. The last option is flying at high speed and low altitudes. Again, the density is high in this case, and combined with the high speed it gives ample lift. On the other hand, the drag will be large too. This means to propel the aircraft we need very powerful engines. This is the domain of military aviation. For civil aviation, the fuel consumption will be way too high. 
air travel would become too expensive. Summarizing, there are four flight regimes. Flying high at low airspeed is almost impossible. Flying low at low airspeed and flying high at high airspeed are common in general and civil aviation respectively. Flying low at high airspeed is done by military fighter jets, although at high fuel costs. The last force I would like to discuss is the aircraft weight. This weight can be divided in three main components. The empty weight of the aircraft, the weight of the payload, which could be passengers, cargo or a mix, and the weight of the fuel. The aircraft empty weight itself consists of the weight of the structure, the weight of the systems, the weight of the crew and of operating items. For an airline, it is important to reduce the aircraft empty weight as much as possible. In that case, more payloads can be transported or the aircraft could fly longer distances. That's why aircraft manufacturers design lightweight aircraft. The main law for any aircraft structural engineer is thou shall design as light as possible. One of the funny effects in weight reduction is the fact that once a weight reduction is achieved, further weight reductions can be harvested. This is called the snowball effect. Assume the mass of an aircraft can be reduced by 500 kilos. That means that less lift is required, so a smaller wing is needed. A smaller wing also implicates that the drag will be smaller and a less powerful engine is required. The smaller wing and engine result in further weight reductions, which trigger a new loop in this cycle. Note that although the size of wings and engines will not change gradually, nevertheless an initial weight saving usually results in an extra weight saving of the same order of magnitude. From this and previous lectures about forces on aircraft, we conclude the following. First, flying aircraft which are heavier than air have a short history, just over 100 years. Second, the main forces in a steady horizontal flight are the lift, the weight, the drag and the thrust. The lift forces can be explained by pressure dif differences over the airfoil. In this lecture I used Bernoulli to understand this concept, but note that Bernoulli is applicable only in a limited setting. The lift and drag have nearly identical equations, they only differ in coefficients. The weight of an aircraft has three main components, aircraft empty weight, payload and fuel weight. And last, there is an ongoing incentive to reduce the empty weight as much as we can, sometimes helped by the so-called snowball effect. These conclusions end this part of the course.